All right, I guess we're on time now. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming here. It's been like really exciting being here uh, the last few days, seeing all the talks, interacting with people, and talk a lot about dependency management and supply chain uh, problems. Uh, so my name is uh, Joseph uh, Heidrup. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Ender Labs. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ender Labs, it's, it's an early stage startup that works on improving the dependency management lifecycle where we try to like improve, uh, like improve with selecting, securing, and maintaining open source uh, dependencies. And uh, apart from working at the labs, I'm also a PhD student at the uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, uh, where I, for the past five years, been working on like researching, studying, dependency management, problems in package repositories, and also what kind of leads a bit to this talk. Uh, I mean, things related to static analysis and program analysis. So the talk is titled, Going Beyond Metadata, uh, Why We Need to Think of Adopting Static Analysis in Dependency Tools. And I thought before we uh, dive into uh, dependency management static analysis, uh, it's sometimes good to always take a step back. And I'm going all the way back to the uh, 1980s. And I think one thing that's been often talked about is with like, you know, security with dependencies, maintenance problems, but we also have to like look back and think about why we're we using like these tools in the first place, because we're doing it for software re reuse uh, mainly. And I was like very curious to know like, uh, how did we view software reuse back then? And I found this very interesting uh, guide from the US National uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, and also what I like with the kind of cover of it, it kind of uh, shows a little bit like, you know, like a dependency tree. Probably already thought about it back then. And uh, in this like, uh, uh, like a guidebook, I found some like interesting definitions of what software reuse is and kind of the ideas around it. And there are two things that kind of captured my attention. So one thing was like with the productivity aspect reusing well-designed, well-developed, and well-documented uh, software improves productivity and reduces software development time, costs, and risks. And the other aspect is quality. Improvements in the quality of software developed from well-designed, well-tested, and well-documented reusable software components. And if you also think about it today, this is kind of what we want. And if you also see like how far have we come with doing this, we have basically starting using, not surprising, packet managers. And maybe it's probably my little bit like academic OCD or something. So like, I mean, there's a lot of talks about packet managers, but I think it's important to distinguish the parts of package management that are interesting. So uh, usually the way I see it, like, like, like there are three main parts. So like one is, for example, like that you have like, you know, the gateway to thousands of libraries and frameworks like the package uh, repositories. And then the other aspect is like, it's also like a way of distributing packages, like for you to easily like uh, publish uh, and yeah, finding them, et cetera. But I'm gonna focus more about this really like on the dependency management and the complexities like uh, around that in general. Uh, and I think for many of you know like the key problems in package management or like the key challenges, but I think it's always good like to kind of like touch base and be on like uh, on the same ground. Uh, so uh, one of the main problems is that you usually come up with very complex and large package uh, compositions. So for example, like uh, uh, like last week, I was like installing like uh, like a very simple like Rust project. I think it was about like 150 lines of code, but I ended up trying to install 307 dependencies for that, and, and that's quite a lot. But it's not only about installing these dependencies. Uh, the other aspect is that, for example, like in NPM or in Cargo, you can have like the same dependency, but like different versions. So for example, if you see in the image here, like we have accepts 1.38, and then another one that is 2.80, because here like Cargo wasn't able to find a single version that could match the dependency specifications uh, in that particular program. Um, and then on the on your left, like we have the the typical package manifest. So we have like you know the list of dependencies that you're using, but also like the version constraints. Uh, 
And here we have like the other aspect of the temporal properties. So for example, like if I install like the, these dependencies today, we have these type of versions. And then three days later, we have a different type of version. So that's also like a challenge that becomes difficult, like especially when you want to build dependency tooling or understanding what's really going on like with your dependencies. And then the other like very common aspect, which is more like from the global perspective, which is often being very much talked about and always pops up like in news feeds, that there's a lot of things going on, like for example, the notorious like left pad incident or like with the event stream user trying people trying to like inst uh, like uh, hide Bitcoin stealing like uh, code, etc. Uh, and that's also like a big concern like for uh, organizations, software developers in general. So like these two, are, I would say like are like the kind of main two aspects that's kind of what you have to think about when you're like starting to like uh, create some kind of dependency tooling or like thinking about uh, what way to like try to understand and deal with these type of issues. Uh, yeah, so kind of looking at like what, what is like sort of the general approach to trying to understand these problems and like with respect. So the first one with the temporal properties, I think uh, here's kind of like what you can do, I mean, you can usually like sort of opt out from, you know, version updates, et cetera, by basically doing version pinning log files. Uh, and I think here, like, we kind of have like a set of tools like on how to deal with it in general. But then for like everything else, we have to start building dependency analyzer, bots, plugins, and able to be, be able to track, monitor problems that might exist in repositories or within your own uh, dependencies. So what is like the usual workflow? Like, so you, you have like the, I kind of like symbolized with a bug, but it can be anything like vulnerabilities, updates, auditing, quality, deprecations, et cetera, right? So that's kind of like the starting point. And usually you would know the kind of uh, exact or like the range of packages or like the versions that have these type of problems. And then comes the second part, which is like in the middle here. So you have, let's say, like your package manifest, which I was showing a bit earlier with the temporal properties. You start like uh, building, let's say, like the relationships between them. Like you resolve the version, you get to your direct dependencies and transitive dependencies. And then, for example, like if, let's say, like the most top bottom package here like has like a problem with the red line circled, that's like how we, for example, we do uh, a reachability analysis. And that's for the most part like how like a majority of be it open source, even industry tool works that you operate on the level like which is what I'm calling like, you know, the metadata perspective. And then we see to the right that although this is like very useful, like in general and also give you some idea, but sometimes it became become too much, which uh, many I would say like online complain about this alert fatigue. You get 200 warnings or like you get uh, 50 updates on the panda bots. It's not very easy to operate with this type of information. Uh, so while this is like a well-known problem, I, I kind of wanted to go a little bit beyond that and look into what is like really the actionability, but also like precision, because we shouldn't let's say like fully sort of downplay that, you know, okay, metadata is like terrible. We should like look into better solutions. But it's always better to try to have like a more pragmatic approach and see like, you know, what are like the trade-offs, what are like, you know, possible benefits or like downsides, et cetera. So that's kind of like where I, uh, uh, let's say, oh yeah, it took more like a research approach, but okay, yeah. Before going into that, it's always good to like revisit before. So uh, I kind of like highlighted on the productivity aspect. So looking at the kind of landscape that we have today, uh, of course, this is, I wouldn't say like very conclusive things, but if you look from very, very short term, if you do software use, right, we, we can easily like reduce, let's say like time costs at the very sort of short term, long term, that's a different question. But one thing that we haven't, let's say like really graphs very well in my opinion is the whole kind of risk aspect or like profiling in general. So that's something that we need to like address more in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, so kind of going back to like this whole sort of like classic alert fatigue thing. So like it's kind of become more like something that we're blaming a lot on. But I kind of want to let's say like focus on like the like quality of analysis and going into the whole trade-off aspect, what is better in which use case scenario. Uh, 
So the first rule that I'm saying is that metadata is not source code. Because when we have a package manifest like this, what is only really telling is only the declaration, but not the usage of a particular pattern or, or package or why we are like, uh, like having there in general. And then going to the second rule is that we should try and make code first class citizens in uh, analysis, which is basically derived from the first rule itself. And you can see here, so this is like an example here, like we have like, you know, the dependency tree, it shows the packages, et cetera. And then we have the other aspect with like the call graph perspective. So call graphs is basically like uh, the functions and like the calls between them. So it also shows basically like from the project and their dependencies. And then the last one, for example, like if you know that a particular function is vulnerable or has like a bug, et cetera, you can basically rule out uh, which functions are like the ones that are impacted by a particular problem. And here if you see like from like a very developer point of view, if you know that version 1.0 has a warning versus knowing that function bus, like in version 1.0 has a vulnerability thing which are being called, that gives you like a much more clear perspective and, and it makes it also more easier for you to understand uh, what is like problematic and what is like going on. Because as a developer, we work more on the source code more than the uh, manifest uh, like information. So that's kind of what, kind of also what I want to highlight here that uh, these two different representations, like they give like very different information and actionability. And the third part, so like the kind of main criticism I usually get is that it's really cool to do program analysis, static analysis, right? But it's often usually very expensive. You sometimes need to have people who have special knowledge and it's also not scalable because usually like when we think of program analysis, we do it from like uh, a project and not a project together with all dependencies. And think back to the example I was giving to these 300 uh, Rust crates. Imagine we have to like build a core graph for all of them. And luckily as a researcher, like I can freely study these kind of uh, questions and issues. So <clears throat> for one uh, like uh, research paper, I looked into trying to build a call graph for every single crate and release on, uh, in, on Rust. So this was like back in 2020. And um, yeah, so I was like able to, from 23,767 packages and 140K releases, I was able to build a call graph in 10 days. And also like, this was let's say like 67%, but in reality, it's actually 80% because many of those releases were actually broken. For example, like from 2014, 2015, that's uh, not really used. But it was fairly quick to build it. And I've also like built uh, call graphs for Java. And that I can also do in like, uh, let's say like a couple of seconds as well. So <clears throat> the general thing here is like, uh, try not to aim for like complicated static analysis. Start with something that's very lightweight, for example, like, uh, using uh, call graphs to understand like a little bit what's happening in like say like dependencies and source code. Um, yeah. And also coming another sort of concern is like, yeah, it's, it's always like a bit of overkill for me to add program analysis. And then the typical question, what about Python and JavaScript? And uh, then you also have like this aspect with uh, like program analysis suffers from false negatives. Like my security customer won't be really happy about it. So there's no point for me of adding program analysis. So knowing all these kind of like different like possibilities and like opportunities and also like the kind of problems, um, let's try to like understand like what will really be like for a very simple question like counting the number of dependencies. Um, what would it be, let's say like if we do that using metadata based versus using program analysis like call graphs to count the number of dependencies. And uh, yeah, this may be a little bit too much to like sort of grasp, like this graphs, et cetera. So um, uh, I would say like the details are not too important. So like I basically like calculated from a different standpoint, uh, time point, the number of direct dependencies. Uh, of course, like from earlier snapshots, like from 2015 and 2018 of the Rust ecosystem, um, there, there's a lot of differences between number of dependencies. Uh, but if you look at the recent snapshots and if we like zoom into like the, the median here, we can see that they sort of like on average, 
relatively like approximate each other. And if you think about it, right, so when we use, let's say, like the direct dependencies, we also, like when we declare them, we're also very likely to use them as well. So in those cases, like if you're not doing like any fancy analysis and just want to know, for example, what is like the number of dependencies that you're using, it can be well enough to just use the metadata and not really having to do static analysis. Uh, and here you see like there are basically three different networks. So like the Prezzi one is like, uh, uh, yeah, basically like using call graphs. The Creso is like the metadata and Doxora is basically compile verified metadata. Um, now that we turn on, on to the transitive dependencies, we have a totally different story here. And we basically have no close approximation. So if you look even in like, uh, when I studied this like in Feb 2020, the number of transitive dependencies like an average project might use in Rust is 17. Whereas when I do the core graph based perspective, it's six of them. And then when I calculate the mean as well, like the average, I also find that 60% of the transitive dependencies are also not called in general. So this is quite interesting. And, and that also kind of made me like very curious, like how can it be such a huge difference between, between those two like representations? And that's also when I kind of did like a more qualitative uh, analysis by doing like a diff between like the, a metadata based, let's say like a dependency tree or like a conventional one versus like a one that is based on, um, uh, let's say like uh, function calls. And, you know, studying like a project together, like with dependencies, not like a fun thing to do, <laughs> especially for large ones. And I did this for like 34 cases. And this is like basically the main differences that uh, I was able to find. So in, in the first case, we just like, okay, so, so those cases were not only like trusty ones, but also like direct dependencies. So I think uh, out of those 34 cases, we had like seven cases which was not totally unexpected. There were for some dependencies like no input statements, but also in others, uh, there were like four input statements, but no actual usage. With usage, I mean like basically no data structures imported, no function calls or any of that. So like it's not totally unexpected. I mean, this can happen like on open source projects. Uh, and then the other difference, and I think this also shows like when you start using static analysis versus like um, metadata bases that you start seeing those features that kind of matters in code. So sometimes like you might, for example, like uh, have this like conditional compilation flags or in the source code, you might have like a specific section that if you like, uh, uh, like set this flag, it will start compiling this code. Um, and if you just use, for example, like the default one, you will see that, for example, one dependency might not be used because you didn't add this extra flag uh, to it. But then on the metadata base, you don't really have this information. So you would directly assume that you're using that dependency anyways. Uh, and then the, the other thing, maybe this is more Rust specific, not the case for like every language, but it's at least like a good case to think about that not all dependencies are like, uh, let's say like runtime libraries or part of like uh, APIs that, that you would uh, directly use or like might also be for code generation. Uh, because in Rust you have like this deriv macro libraries, but from the metadata information, I'm not, not sure if it's fixed yet, but there's no tag that says that this is like a regular library or not. Uh, and this is specifically like with the, uh, Surgery library that, uh, you know, when I build a call graph for it, I cannot directly see like call connections for all functions because they are code generated. Uh, and then another thing which I would say like would be more like of a something of a linting uh, category thing is that you have like the test dependencies. So you, if you wrongly declare it, that's like in your uh, default, like where you would have like your uh, regular dependencies. Uh, yeah, like uh, you might like just put it there and you can basically use it for testing, for example. Uh, I, I'm not sure like if that's changing Rust, but yeah, it, it was shown like that. So that's something that I would say like you can kind of rule out those kind of things. But then this is like the main thing. This is like kind of coming back to the uh, all with transitive dependencies that uh, 
there were like 60 cases of non-reachable transitive dependencies. And what do I mean here? So let's have an uh, example. And before I explain this, so this is like now like a quiz question to see that you actually understood everything of my talk. <laughs> so is anyone brave enough to tell how many dependencies in app version one we have? Yeah, go ahead. Three dependencies. So lib1, lib2, lib3. So that's correct. That is from like the metadata perspective. What about it from a cold perspective? How many dependencies do we have? Two. Two, exactly. And as you can see here, like so I have like denoted the cold relationships. So we have that main calls foo, and then foo calls bar in lib1. And then bar calls used in lib2. But then we see here that we have a function called unused in lib2. And that is called in lib3 used, right? And this is where I mean with the non reachable transitive dependencies because um, we are not really using the, let's say, like unused function in lib2. Uh, but in the meta database, we don't really see this perspective. And what it really shows that context really matters. Because what the kind of assumption we're using when we analyze, let's say, like package data or metadata is that we are uh, explicitly making the assumption that we're using all direct APIs, right, of direct dependencies. And then all the direct, uh, sorry, all APIs of transitive dependencies, which is, I mean, doesn't really make sense like in real life because usually, let's say, like if you have a library with 20 APIs, we might use five of them. Or in other case, if it's like a very important, uh, let's say, like library, we might be using, let's say, like 80% of the API. But thinking about like what the APIs are being used and then further sort of see what it goes down to the transitive dependencies is like really important because that's also like where we can eliminate a lot of the false positives as well when it comes to doing uh, analysis in dependencies. So now I'm going like to the practical uh, uh, like uh, trade-offs. Um, so when we look at uh, declared dependency, like, um, yeah, so when we look at, let's say, like direct dependencies, based on like the analysis and research I've done, we can see that if you don't have like a very specific case where you have to like pinpoint anything, uh, using, let's say, like metadata is, uh, let's say, like enough to approximate what whole graphs or like static analysis would do. And that's like re really true for the case of um, direct uh, dependencies. And um, of course, like uh, in the case of security and let's say like case where you need like very strong uh, like soundness in general, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to use uh, like the whole package space perspective as our metadata database perspective, um, or in general, let's say like, um, you can also like think of like doing like a hybrid solution. But an issue with, let's say like uh, uh, using static analysis, and it comes particularly for uh, libraries that are use a lot of code generation, let's say like, or dynamic features, you might be missing a lot because you cannot capture those function calls in general. Uh, and then, yeah, so those are like, the pros. Uh, the cons, um, on the other hand, is that, uh, yeah, you miss out things, for example, like if you have a library that has like no input statements or like, uh, yeah, and you want to look at maybe some specific APIs, etc., you kind of have to go down and like uh, understand like what are, let's say, like the APIs that are being used, etc. So then you kind of still would need uh, like um, the use of call graphs. Uh, but also, like, you don't have to specifically use call gross as well. Like, even simple, let's say, like, code scan, finding input statements, et cetera, already gives you some idea about what is actually being used as well. And uh, that's something I didn't, like, mention earlier. Uh, and, yeah, the other point that you cannot eliminate dependencies that are solely doing uh, code generation. And then looking at the practical implications trade-offs for transfer dependencies, 
here I would generally, generally like advocate that if you're gonna do something that really captures the whole dependency tree, or at least goes beyond direct dependencies, uh, trying to like thinking about you know, what kind of static analysis tool, program analysis tool, or any code analysis, I think it's very important to kind of take this information account because here context matter a lot. Uh, because like one project might use their direct APIs very differently from another project, and that also affects what kind of transitive dependencies are also being used as well. Um, and I think, especially when it comes to transitive dependencies, like here, like the actionability could also be like, uh, yeah, you also get better of that as well because you can directly pinpoint uh, on problems. And I think that's also the thing as well because like if you look at the direct dependencies, because you have a good idea about how you're using your direct dependencies, you can also directly filter out problems. But for your <clears throat> Transitive dependencies is way more difficult because you don't really know how it's being used or like how it plays a role uh, in your project. Um, and then like the concerns, of course, like false negatives uh, may not be ideal for security applications because that's like an inherent limitation with uh, uh, program analysis techniques. Uh, and then the other point is like if you, let's say, like have to analyze libraries that are like dynamic in nature use a lot of code generation, et cetera. It's, and uh, uh, yeah, that will always be very difficult to do with program analysis. Uh, because sometimes like you might focus on, let's say like a subset of the ecosystem where most of like your libraries are based on that, then you're not gonna get much actionability from using program analysis. So that's, that's like a very important thing to know about. Um, and then we go into like, uh, yes, like in general, like program analysis itself, like precision recall, like the tooling. And so when I've like been analyzing package repository or like dependency management in general, uh, I've actually not focused so much on precision, but I focus more on trying to like have high coverage of language features. Uh, and the reason why is that I feel even though let's say like you might not get, uh, I mean, this particular problem comes, let's say, like for example, when you have to deal with dynamic dispatch. So if you have, let's say, like an application and all the dependencies, and you want to find, let's say, like all the implementations for like a dynamic call, usually it happens that you also link with like other libraries within your program, etc., that has like no connection to this interface. Uh, I mean, that's of course not great all the time. Uh, but at least like you get, let's say like a more clear idea of what is being used and that can be very useful. Uh, I mean, I, I find that even, I mean, it's maybe not ideal, but it's still better than not having this information by looking at uh, metadata in, in general. Uh, <clears throat> but in cases that you need to have, let's say like more precision, so like you might have to consider, for example, like points to algorithms, et cetera. But then you have the problem that it's not super scalable. It might work for your project, but the moment you start going down to like your dependencies, et cetera, and trying to do this analysis, it can take a really long time. Uh, I think in one case a few years ago, like uh, I was trying to analyze like a couple of Java projects with their dependencies. I think in some cases it like took just two hours to build like the call graph with points information. <laughs> in some cases like it never even finished. <laughs> um, and that's the thing, so the general implication is like when you want to do program analysis with, in the context of dependency management, the, you have to think about scope like, of the analysis, which is post your project and its dependency tree. And the second part that uh, package repositories are not like homogeneous collection of libraries. So like one thing, especially like if you're doing research, like you read a lot of static analysis papers, the assumptions are usually made around like some ideal set of packages that has this particular language features. But the moment you start go to ecosystem or starting to, starting to like analyze things in the wild, the situation looks very, very different. And, and that's something like very important to keep in mind because uh, I've seen like, also talk like with a lot of other projects, et cetera, that you kind of directly heavily invest in program analysis, but once you sort of put it in production, you see that, oh, it didn't really work for this customer or that customer, et cetera, uh, because they're using this set of libraries. So it's very important to kind of have that 
uh, yeah, uh, I mean, think about that aspect as well. Uh, yeah, so I've been talking a lot about like program analysis in general, but uh, now looking at let's say like tooling out there because many might, for example, use the Panabot, Sneak, etc., uh, for like dependency analysis. And what I'm like really, really glad to see is that more and more are like moving towards program analysis. So that's like a like a very very good thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so and I think also in general, like we're gonna see more and more tooling doing that. I think the main thing, like, especially like in the open source space, like we need to have, let's say like better maybe tooling support that makes it more easier to like use, let's say like program analysis tools in dependency analysis. Because for example, you might use a tool like Cargo Audit, et cetera. But mm, thinking about how to use, let's say like a Rust core graph, et cetera, is not that trivial or easy. Uh, and that's also something that I'm thinking maybe about how I can for example, like contribute this type of information or like guidelines on how to actually uh, implement it. And uh, yeah, so kind of going to the end. So like, uh, yeah, this is also a little bit like what my research has been about. Uh, so another like possibility. So I've been talking more about from, let's say like the user perspective, like uh, I mean using package management, what about from a community perspective? So the slide a uh, long time ago was showing was on um, how we would do, let's say, like uh, building like code grass for Rust. Uh, and I have actually done a paper where I used the whole, all the code graphs to build like a huge code graph network of Crazed.io. And what is like very interesting uh, here is that uh, when we know, let's say, like the correlation between packages in the ecosystem, we can start like learning about Apart from general question, like you know, what are the most used packages? Uh, you know, like how many packages have, let's say, like uh, dependencies to outdate the packages. Um, but we can, for example, know that if there's like a particular security vulnerability in the ecosystem, we can directly find out through call paths uh, which packages are directly affected, and not showing, for example, like 40% uh, of crates that are always like impacted by this. But by having this call information. We can similar to the to what we're doing, let's say, like um, on uh, the application level, also eliminate false positives as well. Let's say like that, only 20% are actually impacted. Um, uh, the, the other thing as well is that we can also start learning, for example, about you know like what the APIs are being, let's say, like more co-used together. Uh, so, for example, like analogy, like in uh, in Python, is that usually like we have a set of pandas libraries together with numpy libraries that are often used together. What if we, for example, like club them together uh, and see basically like how would the ecosystem uh, look like from that uh, perspective. So uh, yeah, yeah, this more or less like concludes my uh, uh, talk. So does anyone have like uh, questions uh, on uh, like uh, yeah, static analysis, program analysis in general. Uh, let's see. I'll start. Uh, yeah, <laughs> start with you first. So I, I think uh, languages that are like usually let's say like compile based languages, yeah. they are relatively quite possible to do. But then of course like uh, where tooling around static analysis have come, that kind of really varies a lot. For example, like in, a, in Java, which is like very mature, you have like very robust, let's say like static analysis tools, et cetera, that, that are like very easy to do this type of analysis. Uh, also in the case of Rust, like when I uh, like had to do this analysis, there were no call graph library in the first place. I had to like do some kind of trick with LLVM to get the call graph, but then I realized that was not that great, so we had to eventually build our own call graph generator. Uh, but the challenge really comes when we have to deal with, let's say, like uh, Python or like JavaScript, because uh, here we cannot really use like 
I mean, we can use some static analysis, but it doesn't really give like a complete picture. So we we'll always like have to complement with using, for example, like dynamic analysis. Um, there are like some research on where you're trying to sort of use uh, like a crowd sort of based approach. So you know, for example, like you have one JavaScript library and you know like which ones are using it and like on GitHub, for example. So if you run like the test suite of those projects and you can see like what kind of things it's calling on, let's say like the, uh, let's say like in your library, you can sort of like build like a call graph from that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know so much about like a Go specifically, but uh, yeah. So I think there was someone on the back there or? Yeah, sorry? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so how do you mean nested dependencies? No. Yeah. Okay, so if I understood the question correct, so like the question was like, what is like a nested uh, dependency and like how does it like... Um... Yeah, so, so the question is about like uh, in relation to like nested dependencies and trusted dependencies. Yeah, not sure exactly like the difference by it, but from let's say like a program analysis point, so like when you have like a let's say like dependency to something let's say like that exists in a package repository. So the way I would do it is like I would usually say like have to download the code of that and then start let's say like building the, the call graph of it. Uh, or sometimes you can adopt a tooling to like expand the scope. So for example, you can do this in Java. So you have to basically provide, let's say like, uh, yeah, like the source of bytecode from your project and those dependencies together, uh, and those dependencies together, and then start doing the analysis. Uh, which. Yes. Yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, so the question is like, how do we uh, do this type of analysis? Like, how do we actually get, like, the source code, etc.? cetera? Uh, so, like, in the case of, like, Rust, Chris.io, even Maven, and some other package repositories, you can easily use some API that allows you to download this code, and you can start doing analysis directly on it. Yeah, any more questions? Yes. Uh, so I'm curious with some of these static analyzers, do many of them do changes over time, or is that maybe a, a bit too far in the future? Uh, could you repeat again? No. So with some of these static analysis tools, do any of them look at changes over time, or is it just whatever the current code base is, or is that something that's going ah. to be in the future? Ah, yeah. So, okay, so the question is more like, with these static analysis tools, like, are they only looking at like one particular point of time, let's say like of your source code or dependencies, or like do they also look at changes over time? Just a quick addition to that. For example, uh, with ones that you have libraries that are being unused, maybe that could be one way to detect, oh, we used this in the past, but the code that depended on it got removed. That might be something useful for developers to do. Yeah. yeah that's, actually, that's a good point. I think the majority of the tooling, at least what I've seen, they don't actually look at that. Uh, I think definitely that's like, would be very interesting to have this kind of continuous aspect of like how things are changing and basically like build some knowledge around it or like decision making around it. Yeah, that's a good, good aspect, yeah. Any more questions? Yes.
Yeah, so the question is like, what are like the source of uh, false uh, negatives? So this will be the last uh, question here. Um, so in the case of like, um, let's say like in, in Java, for example, you have like a ref reflection, for example. Or like, for example, also when you need to do like a dynamic code generation. So when you analyze the source code, you will see that it's, for example, like maybe loading some JSON file where it has to create, you know, like certain functions, etc. But like the program analyzer cannot like detect that. He only knows, okay, you're reading a JSON file, that's it. But it doesn't know the code that's being generated. So like that is less of like a main source of like false negatives. Uh, I mean, there is less of like active research that is like, you know, working on trying to uh, improve on that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this concludes my session. So if you have any more questions, feel free to like, come and ask me or reach out uh, to me in general. Yeah, thanks.